Colin Wilcox acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations people joining us today. Uh, hello and welcome back to Season 2 of our Equity Couple of Markets podcast. I'm John Hutchinson. Today I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, fellow partners, Michelle Eastwell and Savan Gore. Uh, welcome back to you both. Thank you. Thanks, John. So today we're talking about a important piece of paper in uh, capital raisings by listed companies. Uh, sounds innocuous. Most of the time they look innocuous, but they're of critical importance, and that's the cleansing notice. So we'll touch on why they're used when they can and can't be used, and what happens if there's any breach of those requirements. Um, so maybe, Savan, let's start over there with you. Um, what is a cleansing notice, and, and what's it used for? Sure, John. So cleansing notices are a critical feature of Australia's low-doc capital raising regime. They effectively allow listed entities to conduct a capital raising and other forms of security issues without having to issue a formal disclosure document, such as a prospectus or a PDS, provided they meet certain requirements. And the reason why you would use one and issue one is to then allow investors who are issued those shares to trade on, to trade those shares within the first 12 months of their issue. Otherwise, that would otherwise be prohibited. So this obviously has significant cost and time saving as it allows companies to conduct a capital raise in a much quicker period of time than they would otherwise be able to do. And for, you know, potentially lower cost um, than if they had to prepare full form disclosure documents. And, yeah. and they effectively operate on the premise that listed entities should have all material information about the company out there in the market. And by issuing a cleansing notice, you're effectively cleansing the notice by ensuring that to the extent you don't have all relevant information out there, that that information gets released. So investors can proceed on the assumption that everything that's material about the company um, is is out there in the market. That's great, thank you. Um, so pretty important that you can use one if the alternative is to doing a full-blown prospectus. Um, so Michelle, when can't you use a cleansing notice? So John, there are a couple of key hurdles that you always need to assess against before you can issue a cleansing notice. So um, these include that the securities must have been quoted at all times in the previous three months. So that's often challenging in the first three months following an IPO or when a new class of securities has been recently quoted. So for example, if you've got a new class of listed options quoted, you've got to wait a three month period. Um, we do often get asked whether a trading halt or suspension fails to be quoted then, and that's not the case, but it is relevant to one of the other hurdles. And that is that the company must not have been suspended more than a total of five days in the prior 12 month period. So trading halts don't count towards that, but any days of suspension do. And one particular nuance is, and at the moment it's unsettled law, but that is where a suspension has crept in to the trading on the following day by only a very short period of time. There's no case authority yet as to what length of suspension then rolls into a, a subsequent day for your calculation of five trading days, but certainly the approach that we take is we are on the side of caution and we count any days on which there's been suspension. So you can also consider relief from ASIC on that five day rule, um, but it's it's one of the first things that you look to, has there been a suspension of more than five days in 12 months? So you never want to be suspended, but suspension of more than five days yeah, is, is really bad news if it, it will materially inhibit your ability to raise capital over the next 12 months. Absolutely. And, and for the reasons that Savan mentioned as well as to why these are really useful tools in yeah. um, uh, capital raisings. And is it, um, is it um, relatively easy to get any form of ASIC of relief to extend the five days or I'm, I'm guessing it would be pretty limited? Uh, limited and dependent upon the circumstances. So depending on how much over the five days you've run, how long a period has passed since that occurred and the reason for that occurring as well. So certainly we have experience in obtaining that ASIC relief, um, but it's certainly nothing that you want to back yourself on in terms of um, uh, happily expanding or, or exceeding the five-day period. Um, so there's a couple of other pieces as well, and that's that 
you've got a five day window to actually lodge the cleansing notice. So you will see generally that the cleansing notice will be lodged immediately after announcement to the market of the capital raising, but you do technically have a five business day window and that is absolutely critical. One that you can't lodge the notice before the securities are issued. So you can't lodge it say the day prior to, to actually issuing the securities, but also that you must get it done in that five business day period. And that's where we see most of the non-compliance. Yeah. Um, and that's where we see most of the court applications arising. Yeah. Um, and probably the final piece is as well, being aware that ASIC can actually make orders um, which prohibit a company from utilising a cleansing notice. So if there has, for example, been breaches of the continuous disclosure or financial reporting requirements as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, so timing, obviously, pretty important. Um, so Van, what does a cleansing notice look like? Um, as I've sort of suggested before, most of them just should be one page long. Um, what needs to be in it? What do you often see in in, uh, in a cleansing notice? Good question. And you're right. You know, often you you sort of see a cleansing notice, and it just is one page. And you know, people might think that you know it's a sort of pro forma document, but actually there's you know quite a lot of important uh, consideration and thought that that needs to go into it. Um, firstly, you need to make sure that you confirm that you have complied with your um, you know continuous disclosure and financial reporting. Um, obligations and you specifically state that in the cleansing notice and this goes back to the point that the whole point of the cleansing notice is to ensure that you know the entity is up to date with its disclosures so that the the market is is fully informed and then the second key component of the cleansing notice is that it includes all excluded information so under listing rule 3.1 an entity is is obligated to disclose essentially price sensitive information unless certain carve outs apply. And some of those you know, carve outs are where the um, particular information uh, might involve an incomplete proposal, um, provided it remains confidential. Now, when you're issuing a cleansing notice though, you're no longer actually allowed to rely on those carve outs. And so any information that you're currently withholding from disclosure in reliance on those carve outs does need to be disclosed. Yeah. And so that is a key consideration um, and, and a piece of diligence that an entity looking to issue securities and, and rely on the cleansing notice regime um, needs to make sure they've covered off on. And so often in practice, it's important to have some form of management questionnaire or more formal due diligence process to make sure that there's no information that's considered excluded information that you aren't inadvertently um, not disclosing and properly cleansing the market. Um, as if you do do that, then it would uh, um, inhibit your ability to rely um, on the cleansing notice regime. So that's a real um, sort of forensic exercise, isn't it, into working out um, what information is there within the company that might relate to a negotiation or an incomplete proposal that's currently safe from disclosure under the carve-out but that carve out doesn't apply to the cleansing notice. Um, so you kind of got to weigh up the need for capital as against the need to disclose something that would not otherwise be prone to disclosure. That's right. And it can create some, you know, tricky disclosure issues. Um, you might be in, you know, early discussions in relation to a material transaction, for example, um, and you, you then will probably need to disclose in some form or another details about the transaction um, if you are looking to issue a cleansing notice. Um, so what you've both both said, um, it, it sounds as though there are a couple of ways in which we can fall into breach of the on-sale restrictions, which may be a failure to lodge a cleansing notice on time, issuing a cleansing notice when you weren't entitled to do so, or issuing a defective cleansing notice. So under any of those scenarios, what would you then look to have to do um, obviously, that's not a not a great place you want to be. Um, but if throughout inadvertent in, inadvertence, that's where you ended up, um, what do you do? Look, the first thing you want to do is immediately contact ASX and request either a trading halt or a voluntary suspension of your securities, uh, so that shareholders aren't able to continue trading. Uh, at least shareholders that have been issued securities aren't able to continue trading in circumstances where they themselves might be in breach. This then allows you to go and investigate the circumstances of the breach and also to understand if any shareholders have in fact um, been trading on those securities because this will then inform what steps you can take. If 
no one that has been issued securities has traded in their securities, then you could issue what's called a cleansing prospectus, which effectively is a more full form disclosure document, which then allows those shares that were issued to be traded. However, if there has been some trading in the securities um, on the expectation that they were freely tradable, then that's not going to cure um, the breaches that those security holders have technically committed um, by on selling their securities within the first 12 months. And so in that case, you would then need to go and apply to the court for specific relief um, to cure the issue. How cooperative? Because I'm but this is um, technical irregularity is an application to correct technical irregularity. And my impression was, was that the courts are kind of, that sounds promising, but are often reluctant to do that. Um, is there any prospects of the court making orders that would help in this sort of situation? Yes, definitely. So there are a number of examples where, unfortunately, you know, this has occurred um, and listed entities have had to run to court in order to fix the issue. And the court is open to um, correcting these irregularities, provided you can satisfy the court um, essentially that um, you know it was an inadvertent error, um, it was an honest mistake, and that there has been no um, prejudice suffered, um, whether that be the um, unsuspecting shareholders who have subsequently um, acquired the shares. Um, and also ensuring that the you know shareholders that have gone in and sold them have acted um, in an honest manner as well. Yep. And and Michelle, maybe just over to you. Um, what sort of orders would a court give that might uh, might help? So there are a couple of key orders that are usually sought in these matters, and that that firstly there's an order sought extending the time to actually lodge a cleansing notice because quite clearly you're going to be outside of the the five business day period, and also a declaration that 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 period's to apply retrospectively, so you effectively are taken to have issued the cleansing notice within the required time frame. Um, you're also generally seeking a declaration that any on sale that has actually taken place is not technically invalidated due to, due to the delay. And finally, and this is a point that Savan touched on as well, relief from civil liability, because it's not the company that we're only looking at here. It's also any potentially unsuspecting recipients of those shares who've actually traded within that 12-month period in a non-compliant manner. So that relief from civil liability as well is, is quite relevant. Thank you. Um, all right, well, we've spent a bit of time today on um, what to do with things go wrong with your cleansing notice, um, but obviously any inability of shareholders to trade shares, any breach of on-sale restrictions is a, not a comfortable place to be. So it sounds as though to avoid that, the key takeaways are make sure your timetable is right and you lodge it on time. And secondly, make sure the content of it is right, which particularly might involve judgment calls around when and how to disclose information that would otherwise um, be subject to the confidentiality confidentiality carve out. Um, Michelle Savan, thank you. Anything else before we uh, call it a day? I think, John, probably the other key takeaway is if notwithstanding great intentions to, to make sure you are following um, the prescriptive measures, it doesn't go to plan, really key is acting very promptly because um, that's really critical in terms of if you do need to seek an application or declaration from the court that you have acted in good faith and urgently sought to rectify the issue. That's great. Thank you very, very much, but, um, Michelle Savan. Um, thanks everyone for listening today. As always, please get in touch with us if you have any questions. You can find our details on our website, which is hallandwilcox.com.au or connect with us on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please rate, review or follow our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. You should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances.